Okay. I'll try. <coughs> we'll just stop. Just stop me whenever. Okay. So I said I'd like to talk to you about Adopt um, OpenJDK, but I need to put it in context. And I also need to do a sales pitch to you for some open source software. Okay. So you know all that. You know where I come from. Okay. So I'm going <coughs> to. Excuse me. <coughs> Deep breath. Mm. So we're now now going to do something positive and not negative. We're going to start with a history lesson. Okay. Who's got one of these? Hey, Mac users? Yeah. I got one of these. I've got all of these. Different adapters. Um. <coughs> you know what it's like? They bring out a new laptop. And then you've got to go buy all the all the ancillary stuff, okay? Um, if you're lucky, you can get away with buying things like this. I have multiple number of these because I travel to different countries, okay? It is awful. It is awful when you have to keep buying new things just to get the day job going, right? Think about though, from the point of view of the suppliers. So from the supplier's point of view, it's also painful that there are all these different plugs. I said that, this is painful, right? You can see it's all over the place where we have lots of countries that have different sockets, bear with me, and so you have all these people trying to produce goods that will fit a different, in different countries. And sometimes they do it this way, sometimes they do it the Apple way, right? Sometimes they don't do it at all. <coughs> Excuse me. In some countries, you can't have a replaceable uh, cable if it's going to be used in the kitchen or the bathroom. So kettles and things in the UK, uh, nowadays it's all wired in. You can't change it. It's a pain because if you're a kettle manufacturer, what do you do? Do you make well, lots and lots of different ones for each different environment, or do you just give up and say, I'm just going to pick one marketplace? You want the biggest marketplace you can get, and if everybody works together to give you the biggest marketplace, we all benefit, right? Because uh, you rise with everybody else. IBM has been supporting Java since the beginning, and I really, you know, I started doing Java before it was one, IBM went, this is going to be really good because Java gives us the ability to create something. Java gives us a free platform. It's the same behavior on every single operating system hardware that you can think of. That's its job. It allows the JVM and the Java class libraries are there to help you do your job. So the thing that you build can be successful on a wider range. If you're selling software, it means you have a bigger marketplace. If you are not selling software, you're abusing the software for a business purpose, it gives you flexibility. You can change your mind who you use, okay? Java unites and binds us. And it's been like that for 20 odd years, okay? But the last few years, it's been a bit wobbly. And then recently, this happened. Oracle said, you know that Java stuff that you got for free, we're going to charge you for running it. Their software, their title to do that, nothing wrong with that. Okay. So Java SE is no longer free for commercial use. But the good news is OpenJDK is still free. The project, the source code is still free. How many of you knew that Oracle had changed the T's and C's and that you now had to Good. How many of you are planning to do something about it by moving to not Oracle? Okay, thank you. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that's good. Okay, so bear with me, this is, this is going someplace. So Oracle is still free. You don't have to pay, uh, OpenJDK is still free, okay? But you might have to pay for support. And that's the model that everybody's trying to get to with these big, um, ubiquity markets. We need the big ubiquity market, the Java platform, 
but you still have to pay the engineers to create it. So you've got two choices. You either make money from the things that you build on top of it, or you, play, you charge somebody to support it. Okay. So, you might want to have a look at the other places that you can get free Java, because it isn't just OpenJDK. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what options you've got. I want to talk about this, the Java community because there's a bunch of stuff going on that would be that's interesting, that explains why we're doing Adopt, and and because I get paid for a living, um, I'm going to tell you about the IBM Sport offering, off offerings. One slide, I promise. Okay, so we've talked about this big space. When you are making a decision about um, where to invest your time and your time and your lifespan. Right, depending on who you are, you're going to make dis different thoughts. But it all comes down to the same thing. If you're a Java developer or any developer, you're saying, well, if I'm going to learn something new, is it going to pay well? Are lots of developers learning it? Okay, what's the community like? Has it got a future? Okay. The managers may be going, well, is it productive? How cheap are these developers? Can I get stuff done? And then the ops guys are going to say, can I get updates? Is it supported? Uh, Vi is so much better or whatever, you know? Okay. But they all have their own vested interests in the platform. But it takes time, commitment, money. You have to buy in. You, can't, you have to do the whole works, okay? And whatever it is that we choose, whatever it is, we have this whole choice about we're all, we're all, you all do this, I do this. We make decisions about investing our time, our mental energy in these places. You know, does it have a future? I'm not going to do that. That's dead. Okay. Once you're in it, you might go, I don't want it to die. But it's because it's an investment. Will it make you successful? Will it make your career better? In whatever aspect. Right. You want to feel that all your time and money that you've invested in yourself learning these things to create these things the applications that you've written are all going to be successful and going to be around you don't want somebody to come to you tomorrow and say okay we're turning it off you have to go do something completely different it's horrible so you end up asking yourself this is java in safe hands now safe hands has a bunch of balances so there's like, how fast do things happen? What's the pace of innovation? Are things happening fast? Okay. Versus how stable is the platform? I don't want a platform that changes every 30 seconds and keeps breaking me, versus I'd like one that does change. <coughs> Where does it take place? Open or closed? That's your choice. Is it, you know, do I pay money for it? Do I get open source, et cetera? And what do I think is happening within the people who are leading the community? For some time, we've been rumbling around going, well, we don't think the balance is right. There's something not right. right. And this isn't going, Oracle, you are bad guys. It's just, as a Java community, we've been going, it's, it's not fast enough. There are things we need to do. We, can't, we started to get this image. Okay. Oh, I wouldn't write that in Java. I'll do it in something else. Okay. So... This is the good news. Over the last few years, things have been changing. So you know that Oracle and the OpenJDK community moved to a six-month cadence. You may know about things like MicroProfile. Have you heard of MicroProfile? Anybody? Okay. So MicroProfile is a, is a reimagining of the Java EE spec for the cloud. Okay. And it has a whole bunch of people behind it, including people like the LJC, Sue Java. So Java communities are getting into standards, not just commercial guys. And then things like Jakarta EE, who heard about Jakarta moving or Java EE moving to Eclipse? Yeah. The new home. Again, all these different vendors 
and participants, and again, not just your usual suspects, are all getting together to make this community change. Because we were, the community, all these guys have been around to make, get us where we are, but we've been realizing that it's not working. So there have been all these massive changes. Um, IBM contributed its um, uh, app server called Liberty to Eclipse. No, not to Eclipse, to itself. Um, IBM contributed the OpenJ9 JVM to Eclipse. Okay. And you have to ask yourself, so uh, MicroProfile, Jakarta EE, IBM contributing its code to source code, its source code to open source projects. Why? <coughs> Why are we doing this? Well, I said about this balance, but it's even more direct than that. Um, what drives us? This thing. I didn't bring any with me. I had some. Okay. We do what we do because we're driving for economics. I can stop now if you want. Okay. Uh, let's stop now okay. and then we'll finish it off. You know what? Just scroll back and say thank you for you. Huh? Just like IBM. Oh, that one. I could do there. No, I've got a much, yeah, yeah. I have a much better slide than that one, but yeah. I don't know the one you're Yeah, okay. Right. Back on? Yeah. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just carry on. Okay. So now you've had food and alcohol, you're going to be very sl sleepy, aren't you? Okay. So, if you remember, we were talking about the whole ecosystem and the concerns that people were having around how vital is Java. You know, you're seeing things that Oracle have been doing. You've seen software moving places. So I wanted to talk about why that's happening. And I want to talk about one of the big drivers that's making the change, which will lead me on to why I want to talk about things like Adopt. So we all get driven by this. Pretty much all of us get driven one way or the other by economics, right? It's all about faster, cheaper, better. Can I do the same thing for less money? And that's always been the big one. For many years, Java's innovation has been around one particular type of economics. This one. Who's heard of Moore's Law? Okay, so I'll explain for those of you who didn't put your hands up. So Moore's Law was this observation by this guy called Moore who identified that the amount of power available in the same s real estate was doubling every 18 months. And what that meant was that uh, chips were getting more powerful on a regular basis. And what that meant for the Java <coughs> community, or rather for the JVM guys, so that would have been Sun and IBM and whoever was involved, was people, they said, please make sure that you give to the Java developers and the Java businesses 100% of the new value that comes by moving to the next version of hardware. Okay, If we were to steal some of that, that value, then that would make moving to the next version of hardware less attractive, less economic, and so we wouldn't sell the hardware. So the hardware guys, the chip manufacturers, everybody's going, keep doing this. Okay, You can see this one was done before Moore's Law broke. I think this was done about 2010, I think this thing was done. But the point was, that was what we were driven to. And if you've been around Java long enough, you may have realized that what that meant was is that we've built this walled garden. Java was designed and has evolved and has been driven towards this walled garden idea. All my Java application runs on the inside, on the VM. It doesn't talk to anything else. It is very insular. Okay, and we made it the best to do that. How many of you have written J and I code? Wow. Okay, one or two of you. It's horrible, isn't it? Guess what? I was at Sun. No, um, I was at Cupertino when J and I came around again, and J and I 
They talk about JNI being one of those things that it looks like it was designed to make sure you didn't want to use it. And that's exactly why it was done. The thing before was horrible, but JNI is necessary evil. The guys who invented it went, we really don't want you to do this. So it ha we're going to make it as precise for our needs, which is to make sure that you as a user JNI do it as little as possible. We built a Java wall. Everything goes inside the garden, doesn't want to talk outside. And if you think about it, uh, we have built the best environment. You make use of a Java runtime that is the best of breed. It's got the best garbage collectors. It's, it's got the best JITs. It scales the best. It's tackled all the hard problems. Right. It can do things that no other programming language can do. Individual programming languages may say to you, well, I can do that thing better. And you go, yeah, cool. Maybe you can do that thing better, but you can't do all this. And wherever you slice it, you come back to the JVM is the best thing. Okay, and that's why everybody keeps coming back to investing in JVMs. That's why we keep pushing it because it's the best place to do this stuff. If you want to write business applications, you're going to write them in Java because it is the best. Trouble is that we built this based on what the outside world told us, not because some Java programmers got together and said, hey, we want to do this. It just happened because of evolution. And then this new one turned up cloud okay how many people who how many i have to ask this i ask this as often as i can how many of you are in a position where you have uh deployed something in production to public cloud okay cool how many of you are thinking about doing it in the next 12 months oh okay yeah, that's slightly less hands normally when i ask that i get 10 percent tell me they've done it and 80 percent say they're thinking about it and that's the same percentage as it was last year. So obviously, we're not quite doing it. Anyway, cloud comes along. Economics is still important, but it's changed. Because cloud says to your accountants that compute equals money. And they get that. Accountants understand that relationship because it's, I buy compute power, which translates mostly into this number. It says, cloud says, if you want more compute power, you buy it. Accountants go, I understand what that means. You are not going to buy a big box and sitting in the corner forever. You're just going to lease things. I understand that. And they understand that equation, gigabytes per hour. I got that. So as a Java developer, it now looks like this. <laughs> right. So now, if you fiddle with your MX value, your accountant gets involved because now you're going to buy more capacity on cloud to run the application and then cost goes up or you hit that extra tier point and suddenly it's like, ah. so this is the new thing that we need to deal with. Let's talk this a bit slightly differently. So you've got an application in the cloud uh, or an application anywhere and you have some demand and it's some wiggly line of demand, okay? With whatever wiggly line it is, it's a wiggly line. And then you think about how you respond to that demand. Right, so if you're doing it on-premise, you just buy a big server, so capacity. And the biggest capacity for the machine that you buy is what you imagine the biggest peak is going to be. That perfectly reasonable thing to do, that's what works for you. But when you move this into the cloud, the economics change the optics and suddenly you look at it like this. You've bought the red bit even though you're not using it. And your accountants go, this is really, really expensive. What can you do about it? What can you do to make it more economic? So you break that thing and you break your big server into smaller pieces because they fit um, under the curve better. And in fact, you probably break it into lots of little pieces because you can scale those easier and they fit under the curve better. Here is why we're all doing microservices. This is it. This is the economics that's driven us to where we are today. So from the Java point of view, it's a bit scary because if you take any one of the boxes, whether it's big or small, 
we've all tuned ourselves, we've tuned the Java runtimes to this profile. So the red is throughput and the white is memory use. And if you look at lots of benchmarks and you look at real life, you'll see this shape. What it means is, is that over time, you don't get to maximum throughput until you spent time. Well, the red line goes up slowly and eventually your application's running at full power. And it's cost you some memory, maybe more memory than you wanted, but it's what the cost is. And then you give the memory back and you're done. And the problem is, when you move that profile to cloud, it costs you even more. Because if your application takes time to get ready to deal with workload, who's dealing with the workload? Another instance of your microservice is there, and you're spending money on that. Okay, so this lag costs you money. And if you use more memory than you need to, to if you use memory to get the thing running, and then you don't need that memory anymore, but you've bought up the top, right? you may have crossed a tier point. You may find that you've had to buy more on Amazon just to get your application started than you need to run it. Gigabytes per hour, okay? So what we're looking to do is to give people profiles that look like this. This is what everybody's trying to figure out. How do I get this? Right? And you've seen things like Graal's talk about it, and you okay, um, and you know, we'll, I'll show you some data from OpenJ9 in a second, but we're all trying to figure out how to get that profile because that's what cloud tells of us. And the nasty thing is, or the nice thing, depending which way you look at it, cloud isn't going away. You can't, if you're not already using cloud, don't think you can hide because all the businesses are looking at the value that cloud brings the ease of use, the deployment model, the economics, and they're saying, can I have that in the data center, please? You noticed how many times you don't hear cloud anymore, you hear Kubernetes, right? That structure of how you create applications, how you manage it, how you deploy it, how you monetize it is coming to you as a developer, whether you like it or not. Well, even IBM's got one. Yeah, let's carry on. Okay. The reason that people like it is because of dashboards like this, where you can see how much it's cost you to run that little thing, whether it's on-prem or outside. Okay. All these things, nice dashboards, easy to deploy, easy to monitor, easy to manage. Why would I not want that? And that's what's happening. And other things are going on, like um, data centers are getting GPUs. Okay, because GPUs are really good for number crunching. Who does number crunching? Neural networks, data analytics, GPUs. So they're going into there. So we're trying to figure out how do I get you access to a GPU without using that horrible JNI boundary? That's a horrible, that's a demand right that we're looking at now. It's really taking us a long time for a whole bunch of reasons which I could talk elsewhere. Okay, and when I say GPUs, how many of you play games, computer games, with nice graphics cards in? Yeah, I do too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, uh, the latest one for NVIDIA is 512 gigabytes, DGX2, two petaflops. <sighs> it weighs 160 kilograms, which, trivia, is the same as a fully grown panda. <laughs> so you're not having that in your laptop. In fact, there are whole data centers. The, the latest IBM supercomputer is pretty much a whole bunch of pandas. It's just large amounts of GPUs. Okay? So the point is, these new economics, the cloud pressures, the new hardware are all coming out and saying to us, we have to do this differently. We need to be able to experiment and innovate faster. That's the biggest pressure on us now. Right? That's why we're doing what we're doing. Under the covers, when you look at what's going on and you go, Jakarta EE, MicroProfile, IBM contributing Open Liberty and J9 and stuff like that, the rise of Graal, the rise of the, the Red Hat's latest, um, was it Quarkus? Quarkus. There's a whole bunch of new tech coming out to help deal with this. Okay? And that's one of the reasons that the, the Open JDK changed its frequency of delivery so that we can get the stuff out so you can try it and you can give feedback back because that's the pace that we need to have. 
and we need everybody to participate right with lots and lots and lots of ways i just realized this is ibm cloud i don't know why um they have lots of we're trying to create and grow all the places so you you come to a user group which is great something else you could do is go get involved in some of the open source communities and start contributing you know and contribution can be just feedback i tried this latest thing it's not it doesn't work for me here's what my use case is those sorts of feedbacks okay so we're trying to give java this kick right we're not running on the enterprise cycle of every 10 years we're going no no we need to give you stuff every six months we want you to try it out but it's not just from open jdk okay so you, these are all great stuff that's coming into open jdk right but there are other places where new in, in innovation is taking place that we would like you to be involved in and just feeding back and voting and saying what you think is it going to do what you want okay Yes, we're building new VM technologies. So Docker is a really good one example. We're building container-aware JVMs because Docker containers do things that you need to be aware of in the VM, otherwise you don't get the results you expect. Um, better interop, removing JNI, replacing it with something else that means we can call the data analytics uh, libraries that are written in Fortran um, without costing too much changing our GC models to be cloud-based. All these things are taking place, value objects. JIT as a service, this IBM we're trying out, what happens if we take the JIT out of a VM altogether and have the JIT encode happening somewhere else? If that gives us benefits, we're trying these things out, right? The whole Java community is, for the first time in a very long time, getting together, and it's not coordinated, it's just driven by the economics of our situation to help us work better together. Right? And it's all free. It's all open. You can get a whole bunch of different Java technologies from, well, you name it. There's loads of spaces. But the thing that I had in the, mo the title of this, Adopt Open JDK. Who's heard of Adopt Open JDK? Okay. Well, you've heard it now. So one of the things that we also as a community recognized is where do you go to get your Java binaries? And especially now if you're going, well, I don't want the Oracle SE one because they're going to charge me. Where else do you go? So for the last, I don't know, year, 18 months, the London Java community triggered this off. Martin Verberg triggered this off. But we have been saying if we had one place where we could build and test Java on all the platforms, all the VMs are available to you so that you as a user, as a business can say, I know that if I go there, I can trust the code that I'm going to get and I can be certain that it's built and tested in the same way in all platforms. So all those little weird vagaries that you might get as Linux users, you can find that you use Java 8 on this version of Linux and Java 8 on this version of Linux and they might actually behave slightly differently because they're all built from different versions, releases of the code. So the Adopt community's job is give you one place for you to get OpenJDK it's binary, it delivers binaries, there's Docker images. You can come here, get your downloads, and we're going to provide security updates as long as possible. Security updates aren't just from Oracle. Security updates come from other companies. They go into OpenJDK. We're building this from OpenJDK. So you will have access to free Java with security updates as long as we can possibly maintain it. And when we can't, we'll move to the next release. Okay. And there are lots of people behind this. Right. So Microsoft involved, IBM's involved, GoDaddy. In fact, the list is probably longer than it was. It's okay. It's just going, oh, and I said, look, I'll just go back. Eight million. It's not eight, it's about 12 now. I did this, this is like f a month old. Right. Uh, so you can choose your VM. And I'll talk about J9 because I think it's something you should just be aware of. But basically, you can come to adopt and get the jar of your choice, the version you want, the platform you want, Docker or downloads, installable or unzippable, okay, from Adopt. So I said about J9. So that's the VM that, well, I actually, I don't work on J9, but I am a JV, JVM developer. The VM that I worked on was a precursor. Well, the precursor was replaced by J9. Uh, 
Not that I'm particularly bitter, because J9 is pretty damn good. IBM contributed it in 2017 because we needed to be part of the story. And you can't be part of this changing story if you're proprietary. It's not about proprietary stuff anymore. It's about open source. And you remember at the beginning, I said about trying to keep this big, big business space going. It's in our vested interest to ensure that Java community continues to grow and that we are stable across all these platforms. Everybody who was there at the beginning benefits. Those, go those of you who join in now benefit. So we contributed our VM so we could be part of the conversation. So J9, oh, whoa. That was, okay. Wow. Sorry, just I pressed one button. I got five slides. Okay, forget that. So what does J9 give you? Well, this nice little shape that we talked about right earlier on. Here's some real data. Here's OpenJDK 9 with hotspot. Okay, the best for the benchmark at the time. It's, it's not to be sneezed at, it's a good number. Here's OpenJ9, OpenJDK 9 with OpenJ9. We just switched the VM from Adopt to the binaries that have got OpenJDK class libraries and OpenJ9 VM against OpenJDK class libraries and hotspot. The blue line is the out of the box difference. So, th ooh, so this gap between the red and the blue line is more work done. And if you think from a microservice point of view, we're not running long running applications, the quicker you can get things done, the quicker you can terminate that microservice, you save money. And if you really want to, you can turn on this AOT mode that we have, uh, which lets you get even faster startups. See how narrow that green line is? but you pay for it by not managing to get the complete throughput. That mode says uh, no more jitting. That mode says start up once, never do any more pre-profiling. Because in this mode, we're assuming that all the CPU time should be spent on your stuff, not on jitted stuff. But that's just a different profile, okay? So to put that in context, um, I think I switched, yeah. So. OpenJ9 out of the box gives you 60% reduction in memory costs. So if you used a gig for doing something, now you can do it with 60% less because it's just the way it's designed. It's nothing special in, in we've just done it. It's like, no, it's always been there. But it turns out to be something that's really good for the cloud because less memory usage saves you money. It's 40% faster starting up than a hotspot. Faster start up saves you money. Okay. Those things are what cloud is about, and we're sharing it because we want to be part of the story towards growing the new Java. We want to talk about putting, ah, okay, these things in. Okay, there's a whole bunch of hardware coming down the pipe that Java needs to be worried about. We have some ideas. We want to talk about how do I get them into your hands? How do I give you the ability to use these things? And to do that, we need to have an open source project that is there to deliver it. So now we have two choices. We have a hotspot. Well, in fact, we have three. We have Graal, we have hotspot, and we have OpenJ9. These are all places where we are be building out new stories. Okay. Uh, J9 gave you all that stuff. If you want to tweak that one, I'm all up for it. Um, but seriously, everybody who, who I know who has just done the switch has had the 60% memory footprint reduction. The others may be a bit of a movable for feast, but that one is pretty solid. So whether you're a developer or whether you are a um, business, you could save money. Right? If it makes sense to you, I've had lots of conversations with people you do mem in memory databases. You can imagine, this is really cool for them, right? That's what J9 is good at. It does all the others stuff as well. That's our good thing. The Graal guys are trying out different things. Hotspot are implementing some of the newer stuff. We've got, um, we've got um, uh, um, fibers coming. There's some really cool in innovation coming. And it's all happening in the Java space. And it's all being done by these different vendors. And finally, here is the one chart that I said. So I said at 
that Java should be free, and we're trying to keep Java free. <coughs> we're trying, and I say we is the Java community, this you guys, you are, should be part of it, are trying to make sure that Java <coughs> is going to be around for the next 20 years, because it can be. But if you do need more than just free Java, and sometimes you might go, I'd like to pick up the phone and ask somebody how I to help me fix this problem, you can come and buy a, a license from us. You can get it for desktop, you can get it for server, and we're cheaper than Oracle. Um, <laughs> okay. But you, there are other people providing su su support, okay? So you're not completely left. If you take free Java, you take all the screw updates, and even if that's not enough, you can still get people. So we will provide hotspot and open J9 support for any of the adopt binaries. You just download adopt binaries, and at one day you have a problem, you buy a support contract and you phone us up. It's not stupidly expensive. So there we go. Um, <coughs> I was just sort of about adopt. Well, adopt is the central nub of what we're doing. Adopt is where it becomes real. Adopt is where you get the new JVMs. It's where you can go to to get the things that you need to do your day job. But as a community, we're doing all these other things to try and align ourselves to give you the future as well. Okay, but that works only if you feedback. So we really would like to have more people participating. Pick your favorite open source project. Just go and have a look. And one of the things that you could do is you could just feedback and say, I just tried your latest driver and I found a bug. Or I've tried this thing and I don't like the way it works. Simple things like that can make all the difference. And if you want to do more and you want to get involved and start writing code, then that's great too. But we would like your feedback at all times in all these open source projects so that we can push Java forward. Uh, that's it. I've run out of, well, I've got one slide, but that's mainly think. Dun -dun -dun. Thank you very much. <laughs>Any questions? Anybody awake? Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, do, do you think uh, uh, that, that uh, Java will continue with uh, this way, with uh, Go, with other languages? This is the first one. Yeah. And the second, uh, do you think that uh, having uh, Java charging uh, uh, Oracle uh, commercial license? Yeah. Okay, so good question. So first question is, how does Java stack up against the other programming languages? I have a whole talk about that. Um, it's a funny talk because we, we do benchmark races. Um, so the simple answer is that you can easily position Java you languages. You can see where they're being used. Uh, so you can see Node becoming you know, the web front end. You can see Go being used to create some of the infrastructure stuff. You can see Python being used for data analytics and machine learning. Some of those things, you may, we may go, that's just the best language to do that in. Right? So, but some of them we're going to say, Java can do that too. We just haven't done that. If we did nothing else, if Java stayed as it was, Java would still be the business language of choice because none of the others can do what Java does and the scope of platforms because you've got to remember that it runs on every platform known to man there's Java and you can take your code and run it around you have to recompile it and, and okay so I don't see Java going away and I don't but as to whether Java will compete with these other programming languages or well comes down to whether or not we want it to so the technical challenges are being addressed the biggest challenge that we have for dealing with things like Python, for instance, is Python is very, very good at calling native code. Java is very, very bad at calling native code because we have JNI. That was just our choice, and we are working to actively fix that. When we fixed it, then it'll be up to you guys to see whether or not you want to take Java to do these things. Do you want to call data analytics code, or is that boat, maybe that boat sailed? So I think. So the answer is, I don't think Java's going away because I think there's too much investment and there's v really strong value in the business, business thing. If you want Java to go into all the other places it could do, 
that's about you making use of it when it happens. If you guys don't champion it, then it will just stay where it is. Okay, and the second question was about Oracle. What was, what was your main point about Oracle again? Um, okay, so I have some off-the-record things I could say, but I won't because I'm being filmed. Okay, but I will tell you, we, the Java community, how do I put this? Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you care about it being called Java? If the future Java was still the same Java, but wasn't called Java, i.e. we said, we can't provide you a Java VM, but we can provide you with a virtual machine that runs Java. Would that be a problem? Would the name change cause you to run away? Because right, it probably wouldn't. And do you care, do you know about uh, a thing called the JCK, the compliance kit? The compliance kit is a thing that says, you, are a you can officially be called um, Java. Well, actually, that's not true. You can be officially pass a test that you can ask Oracle to grant you the right to call your thing Java. Okay? So the OpenJDK binaries, they are runtimes that run Java code. They're not Java binaries. So if you get rid of the naming conversation, okay, which is basically what you get from the commercial side, uh, you're looking, you lose that. The other thing that is that Oracle have been putting lots of development effort into it and that has got less and less over years so and we're all picking up the pieces so as long as nobody gets too scared by the future java maybe not being called java but being called a runtime that runs java we'll be okay right i, I mean oracle you can see from what they're doing they're trying to figure out how to make money out of java and the fact they're trying to make money out of Java by asking you to pay them to run, to run your Java suggests where they are in their thinking. I we don't have a, we don't think that if honestly um, if Oracle said from now on nobody can call it Java, it wouldn't be a problem. The source code is open. Uh, Red Hat are involved in the in the support of these things. There's some guys in Oracle who are doing the innovation, but there's a small number of handful. If it came to it, we'd pick up the pieces. Right. I don't. I don't see it as being a challenge. I just seeing that Oracle could just get grumpy about it. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Yes. How, would, how about the version release uh, between Oracle and OpenJDK? Uh, it's one for one, because it's not Oracle. It's OpenJDK. Oh, did you say it's OpenJDK? Sorry, I thought you said adopt. So your question again: the difference in the release. Yeah. Will the Open JDK will, will be as the same version? Yeah, yeah. So Open Oracle produce a commercial version of Java. There is nothing in it that is not in Open JDK. They open source <laughs> the remaining active things like Flight Recorder and things like that. So Open JDK is, as far as I know, 100% the same as what's in Oracle's Java SE. Right. So if Oracle stopped tomorrow. You could still go and get OpenJDK from Adopt, and you would still have Java, right? So it's not different. For it. You can switch from Oracle SE, from Oracle Java SE to OpenJDK, and f I think it's almost completely seamless. Uh, there might be a s there might be a CA cert or two that's different. I'm sorry, I don't understand. In uh, the 12th version of yeah. Java, yeah. Oracle will not enable, enable uh, Shenandoah VC in their uh, version. Okay. On, on uh, Adopt or yeah. OpenGK, it's uh, enabled. I, and that's up to you. Yeah, so you can, uh, if you don't like that, if you want to go back to having it disabled, yeah. you can turn up Adopt and say, can you do one that, that's 
build it differently. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, we look at this and we're going, there's just, if you move from an Oracle SE to an open JDK, you can, Oracle themselves are talking about, if you don't like their Oracle, their RSE thing, you can use their open JDK binaries, which you can download from their website. But they don't update that very often. So you can go to adopt and you can get daily builds, regular updated, tested across all platforms, big testing and it's getting bigger and bigger. The only thing that it is not is it is not this JCK certified. So we can't call it Java because it doesn't have this test. Other than that, it's f open JDK. It's the same code base that um, we used to use in IBM. We don't, we usually adopt builds now. Um, it's the same code base that uh, um, Amazon Caretto guys are using. They're taking open JDK and building it and shipping it. Uh, and you know, it's it's open JDK. It's it's under GPL, but that's that's the way it works. If you desperately want a support contract or you want something that's not under GPL and you want to use um, Java, then you'll have to go talk to Oracle, but or you can come talk to IBM because we have we can offer you similar things. But at the end of the day, it's the same Java. It's the same code base. Right? It's just the differences are so trivial, and the differences are more to do with temporary differences rather than anything fundamental. Over the process of uh, making evolutions, will, will it pass uh, all those JCP and TCK or OpenJDK? Uh, so you're not allowed to run the TCK unless you have a license from Oracle. You can't get the TCK. But the TCK itself, if you, if, if you ever have the privilege of looking at it, compared to what all the test suites that get run to prove that Java will run your favorite application and your favorite dependencies far outstrip what's in the TCK. Right? The TCK is a compliance thing for business purposes. It is not a test suite. And that's what, they, and that's what Oracle would tell you. So again, don't worry about the, whether or not it gets TCK'd or not. Right? That's a nice to have. That gets us the logo. But without that, it's still Java. Right? It runs, they, the, the adopt guys run millions of tests on all these platforms to make sure that it pass, it will run your Java. It is the same thing you get from Oracle. It's just built by a different set of people. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for listening to me talk and I appreciate. <laughs> I, I appreciate I may have drifted off into English. Um, if at any point I said something that you want to follow up, ask me, or that's my Twitter handle, you know, or just find me on LinkedIn and, and talk to me. Okay.